Hi, I'm Manpreet, a medical student at Birmingham and a lead tutor at Aspiring Medics. Today we're going to go through 10 key medical ethic questions. Station number one. A patient's genetic test uncovers a BRCA1 mutation, increasing her risk of breast cancer. However, she opts to remain uninformed and cancels all her future visits. How should you handle this scenario? Although the BRCA1 mutation indicates that this patient is at an increased risk of both breast cancer and ovarian cancer, this patient has chosen to not be informed about her genetic screening. So in this particular case, it's paramount that we respect her autonomy and do indeed um, respect her decision of not being informed about this. My first step would involve making sure that the patient is fully aware of the risks that come with not knowing, as well as the benefits that come with knowing about her genetic risks. This would involve having a very compassionate and supportive conversation with the patient, um, where I can explain all the consequences of whatever decision that she does make. This would include um, letting her know about the benefits that come with um, detection and early preventative measures um, if she chose um, to be informed. Additionally, in situations like this, it's very important to elicit any um, reasons why she's choosing not to be informed about her genetic risks. This may be things like she might be afraid of certain things, um, might be anxious, there might be some uh, misinformation or uh, mistrust regarding particular treatments and preventative measures. Um, and then therefore I would offer any um, support like counselling services um, in order to help her. It's really important that we do respect her choice, but also let her know that she can come back and change her decision at any time moving forward. I would document her decisions very thoroughly so that if she were to change her mind, other healthcare professionals would be aware of all of her notes. As well as this, I'd reassure the patient that all data that's being held about her is strictly confidential. Station number two, should medical students share exam contents with each other? Medical students should not in any circumstances share um, content regarding medical examinations um, as it violates very important principles uh, such as academic integrity uh, as well as confidentiality. And these key principles, they stretch beyond just medical education all the way uh, until that student is a clinician. Sharing medical school examination content distorts the fairness that comes with the assessment process. And once discovered by uh, medical institutes and medical schools, there can be very severe consequences, such as being excluded from the medical school. Cheating reduces the value of the qualifications that are being earned, um, as it undermines the individual's actual knowledge and competencies. And this in the future, can result in very detrimental mistakes being made by that individual once they are in the clinical setting, which can endanger patients. Instead of sharing content um, from these examinations, students can focus on different types of learning, such as um, peer group teachings, um, group discussions, and using materials that are actually from the institution um, in order to help them with their revision. Upholding academic integrity is vital um, in ensuring trust and ethics in the medical profession. And ultimately, this ensures honesty and fairness in patient care, um, as well as in professional relationships. Station number three. You're placed with a fellow student on clinical rounds who records a video for social media during the rounds. How would you best manage the situation? Recording videos um, in clinical rounds, ward rounds, raises a lot of problems um, in this scenario, particularly surrounding confidentiality, um, as well as professional conduct. My first step would be to talk to the student privately in a setting where there aren't any, aren't any other patients or any other professionals. Um, and then I'd want to uh, speak to them in a very respectful manner, but then not downplay the situation since um, the consequences of having, for example, patient data, patient information out on social media can be quite significant. I would explain to the patient that they may be uh, violating patient privacy laws. For example, if patients' faces or data regarding their health may accidentally end up in one of their videos, um, as well as the ethical concerns that come with doing this without patient consent. If the student is unaware of the particular policies in place, I'd first of all help them uh, become aware of these by following the institution's guidelines on social media use and recordings and such. I'd also try and redirect the student towards the educational value that comes with being in these ward rounds um, and doing these ward rounds and these clinical rounds without being distracted uh, and using social media during them. 
if this behaviour were to continue even after the conversation, for example, the student continue make, continues to make these um, videos without um, adhering to the guidelines, then I'd essentially escalate the matter to my seniors. Um, so in this particular scenario, it would be the educational body within the hospital that's in charge of our uh, clinical rounds. Protecting patient privacy is very important in the healthcare system um, since it maintains trust. So it's paramount that we keep patient confidentiality a top priority. Station number four, a patient's lasting power of attorney, LPA, refuses a surgical procedure against medical advice. How would you navigate this situation? So a lasting power of attorney, an LPA, uh, is essentially a document that allows someone else on behalf of the patient to make decisions regarding that particular patient's um, health, welfare and their care overall. So when an LPA refuses a particular treatment, such as a surgery in this scenario, it's important that we balance um, the right that the LPA um, has over making the decisions for the patient, as well as what we believe as medical professionals is what's best for the patient. First, I'd need to verify the validity of the LPA and to see whether they do have rights or whether they do have the right means to make these particular decisions about this patient. And then I'd want to have a very thorough, uh, very compassionate conversation with the LPA and make sure that I do understand the reasons for them refusing this particular treatment, as well as letting them know about the benefits that come with doing the treatment um, and why it's in the best interest for the patient really important that we uh, elicit any misinformation or any um, ideas that the LPA may have about this surgery um, so that we are completely aware of what's influencing their decision. If there is, for example, uncertainty in um, whether the decision that the LPA is making aligns with what the patient would want, then we might want to get the ethics committee involved. In cases where refusal on the LPA's end may lead to significant harm, and if the decision that's being made does not align at all with, with what the patient would have wanted for themselves, then it may be the case that we um, get a court ruling in order to override the LPA's decision. Throughout this process, clear communication, empathy and adherence to legal and ethical guidelines is crucial to navigate this situation in a good manner. Station number five, you are the UK Health Minister. Would you fund a novel genetic treatment costing £100,000 per patient, which is equivalent to three nurses' salaries, or fund 50,000 vaccines? To answer this particular question, we need to focus on several things, such as cost-effectiveness, um, public health impact, as well as the ethical considerations that come with resource allocation. The genetic treatment that costs £100,000 per patient um, offers a very targeted approach to a very specific disease and would therefore mean that we'd have uh, better patient outcomes. However, funding the 50,000 vaccines um, would be more effective in the sense that it would have a broader impact on public health and would reduce things like um, infection outbreaks, mortality, morbidity, as well as promote herd immunity to the wider population. Vaccinations are a very cost-effective intervention since they benefit a very large subset of the population as well as decrease healthcare costs by preventing outbreaks. In contrast, while the advancements in genetic um, medicine are very novel and very new and showcase great advancements, um, they are very expensive and the number of people that do benefit from them is very small as opposed to the number of people that can benefit from the vaccinations. Given the principles of maximising public health benefits and making sure that we um, have equitable access to healthcare all over, um, funding the 50,000 vaccinations um, campaign would be a lot better in the longer run. Additionally, vaccinations over the decades have a track record for their effectiveness as well as their safety, making them a much more reliable form of investment uh, as compared to novel genetic treatment. Station number six. During medical shadowing, you witness a nurse confessing to a doctor about an erroneously administered drug dosage, which fortunately doesn't harm the patient. Is it necessary to inform the patient about this mistake? In this situation, it's very important that we balance transparency as well as non-maleficence. Although in this case the patient wasn't harmed by the incorrect drug dosage, they still have a right to be informed about the error. Hiding this error from the patient can undermine the trust that they have in healthcare professionals and the healthcare system. 
and trust is vital for effective care delivery as well as effective decision making as well. Patients depend on healthcare staff, professionals and the system to provide accurate information about their entire healthcare delivery and being dishonest with them would violate this trust. So to approach this uh, patient, I would have a very compassionate and open communication with them, um, letting them know that an error was made um, with the incorrect drug dosage. However, there was no harm that was done to them. But still, I'd still emphasize the point that um, there have been steps that have been taken to prevent this from happening again. This conversation would need to focus on regaining that trust and building up their confidence again um, in believing in the healthcare system and uh, what staff are doing for their care. Additionally, I would also help the nurse when it comes to reporting this error and making sure that they do it via the right channels. This would uphold accountability and promote a safe culture when um, it comes to doing the right things in the clinical settings. By addressing this issue very openly and by being very transparent to the patient, we not only respect their autonomy, but we um, improve future care practices as well. Station number seven. During a clinical attachment, a patient admits purchasing discounted diabetes medicine online. Fearing the doctor's reaction, she asks for confidentiality. How would you respond? In this particular scenario, our main concerns are duty of care, as well as patient confidentiality. While the patient has asked for confidentiality, which means that, for example, we don't tell their respective GP surgery about this, there are a lot of risks that come with purchasing medications online. And these risks um, mainly surround things like these medications using unregulated ingredients and having um, incorrect dosages within them. As a medical student, my role in the situation would be to first of all prioritize and respect their decision for, um, to not tell their respective um, GP practitioner. But I'd also want to let the patient know of the risks that come with them purchasing this medication online as well. I would first engage in an open and non-judgmental conversation with the patient where I'd want to understand their decision behind purchasing these diabetes medications online, as well as understanding or helping them understand um, the risks that come with doing this. I'd really want to get down to the bottom of why they're doing this. For example, they may be particular financial reasons um, or misinformation about these medications. So I'd want to elicit that as well. I'd also really want to help the patient understand that um, as a, a doctor's role, um, as a physician's role, that it's not their place to judge them based on the decisions that they make about you know, where they're taking their medications from. But I'd also encourage the patient to have an open conversation with their GP practitioner as well, so that they can monitor uh, any adverse side effects from the medications that they are using online. If the patient still insists on using um, these medications without letting their physician know, then I'd really have to um, weigh the harm that may come from potential you know, negative ingredients within the medication and weigh that with um, respecting their decision of keeping this confidential as well. If the medication that they are taking, however, does pose a significant risk to the patient's health, then I need to inform the, their practitioner in a way that still preserves the trust between me and the patient. The ultimate goal here is to safeguard the patient's health and make sure they're having the best treatment possible whilst also um, respecting the decisions that they make. Station number eight. A company offers to sponsor £500 for a free senior health screening event you are organising if your team wears and promotes their negative ion bracelets, meant to restore balance to the body. Would you accept this offer? First of all, it's crucial for us to understand whether these negative ion bracelets uh, has evidence, good evidence that backs up its health claims. As healthcare professionals, we have a duty to provide the best, most up-to-date um, evidence when it comes to particular treatments or um, and diseases. And this also applies to any products that we are promoting. We need to make sure that anything that we do share with the public is reliable and isn't influenced by any commercial interests that we may have. Although the £500 sponsorship will help us with the event, um, it's important for us to consider the potential impact they may it may have on our event's integrity, um, as well as the kind of message it also sends to um, our participants too. So I'd essentially politely decline this offer unless the particular company can provide robust evidence uh, and reliable evidence from their respective researchers and clinicians uh, supporting their claims. Instead, I would try and seek funding from um, community providers um, and health organisations whose goals align uh, more seamlessly um, with the event and, and the screening. Station number nine. A doctor faces a life or death decision involving their own family member. Should the doctor be involved in making this decision? 
In this particular scenario, we are faced with a conflict of interest, which is essentially when our personal relationships can influence our professional judgment because we're, uh, because in this particular scenario, for example, we're involved with the family member. So while doctors are trained to make life and death decisions about patients, however, if they are involved um, in situations where it's their family member or friends, um, their judgment can be clouded um, due to emotional bias. Personal emotions, especially when it's a family member's or a friend's life at stake, um, can impair the doctor's ability in making informed evidence-based um, decisions. So in this particular scenario, it's not appropriate for the physician to be involved in, uh, in the patient's care. Instead, another physician who can remain emotionally detached and remain objective should um, take the lead in the decision making. Um, this means that the family member involved uh, will receive the best possible care free from any bias and as well as um, any conflicts of interest too. However, the doctor can still play a very important role um, for their family member by providing emotional support and helping them understand the situation a lot better. However, the main decision making um, should be left to the doctor that's um, objective and emotionally detached from the situation. This separation helps us ensure that the patient's best interests are a priority um, without any personal um, influences. Station number 10. A low-income patient is recommended by a physician to undergo an expensive heart procedure, offering limited improvement. What ethical considerations are involved? By considering the principle of justice, where we need to be fair with our resource allocation, the patient has every right for them to be offered this expensive um, treatment. By considering the principle of justice, where we need to um, allocate resources fairly, um, the patient needs to have equal access to this regardless of their financial status. However, we also need to balance it with um, cost benefit, particularly if the um, treatment that we're giving them doesn't really improve their quality of life um, and leaves them in a worse off situation. First of all, the patient um, would need to be fully informed about the benefits as well as the risks that come from this particular treatment. This also includes discussing alternative treatments that are less costly um, but equally e effective um, if they are available. However, again, it's very essential for us to weigh the potential benefits um, and whether that's justified by the financial burden this may have on the patient, um, especially if the quality of improvement is not as significant um, or doesn't equate the amount of money that the patient would be paying. Additionally, the physician also needs to consider the pillar of beneficence doing good and the pillar of non-beneficence doing no harm. So in this situation, um, providing a very expensive heart treatment, which may actually um, be too expensive for the patient, may do more harm than good. So in this case, it might be more ethical for us to um, explore other options that align a lot better with the uh, patient's financial capabilities.